Thank you. They'll be turning to Judges chapter 3. It's where we're going to be at this evening. Uh, I just want to forewarn you, out of the 10 sessions that we're going to be doing out of the book of Judges, this is probably my favorite. Um, and you're probably thinking, well, why not Gideon? Why not Deborah and Barak? What about Samson and all this? You'll see why once we get started, I love this story right here, Ehud. We're going to be talking mainly about Ehud. But um, I want to begin by giving you a quick review. We'll be in Judges chapter 3. We'll give you a quick review of last week. Just general points that will guide us through the book of Judges. Number one, I said last week, I said the problem in the book of Judges was this. Small areas of disbelief, of disobedience, they will lead to large areas of disaster. And we see that throughout the book of Judges. Number two, compromise always leads to bondage. And thank God Jesus Christ came to set us free. Then number three, I said last week, I said spiritual amnesia, spiritual apathy leads to spiritual apostasy, walking away from his truth, walking away from his word. And the solution, the whole book of Judges, the solution it points to is Jesus Christ because everything and everyone else, they are nothing but a bunch of empty broken saviors that will always disappoint us but jesus christ he is the perfect savior that was broken for us and he will never let you down and that was last week and this week real quick before diving into chapter three i want to show you real quick from chapter two what the actual cycle of judges is and the same thing about the book of judges the same cycle that we see here is the same cycle we see in the world today and I'm not going to read it to you, but it's found in verses 11 through 23 of chapter 2. And here's the cycle that I want to point out. Number one, the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. They turned their backs to him and they worshiped the idols of the people in the land. And if you remember from last week, I said, Israel, they would push out all the people when they entered into the promised land, but they never did. And the Lord said that these people that they let remain, that he allowed to remain because the people of Israel were disobedient. The Lord said that they would be thorns and stumbling blocks to the people of Israel because they didn't fully obey God. So, number two, the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. Number two, the people, the Lord allowed the people of the land to oppress and enslave the people of Israel. The number three part of the cycle was the Lord would raise up these judges to deliver Israel. And finally, there would be forth this time of peace in the land through this judge. These judges, they were not kings. And I think we all know that by now. They were not kings, but they were administrators. God raised up to oversee the people and through them militarily to deliver Israel from its oppressors. The phrase, and this is key, you need to catch this in case you never have before. The phrase... In verse 16 of chapter 2 is key. It says the Lord raised up judges. As I've said during the series that we just finished on Sunday mornings during Haggai. Any spiritual progress is totally dependent on the Lord's strength. These judges that God raised up. They had no strength. They had no ability or skill to do what God had called them to do. All their strength. All their ability. All their talent. It came from the Lord. And that's key to remember when we talk about these judges. Also, another thing to note in the cycle of sin here in chapter 2 is the fact that, listen, it never says anything as one of the parts of the cycle. It never says anything about the people crying out to God. Now, we hear it all the time. The people cried out to God. And we see it in some places here in Judges. Look at verse 12. You're there if you want to look at verse 18. Verse 18 says this. I want to read it. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of all their enemies all the days of the judge. Now listen to this. For the judge, for the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. Listen to me. The people were groaning because of their suffering. And the Lord, because he saw the suffering, he moved with love and compassion. And sometimes we're going to see that the people did cry out for help to the Lord. But as we get closer 
to the end of Judges. In other words, as the cycle gets worse and worse, and people get further away from God, as we get closer to the end of the Judges, and we see when we get to about week 8 or week 9, we see the story of Samson, you're going to notice one thing. There is no mention of the people crying out for God to deliver them. What God does is He sees the suffering, and God just steps in Himself. It reminds me, of Romans 5 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, in his mercy and grace, with love and compassion, he steps in to offer deliverance through the blood of Jesus Christ, even when the people are not seeking and searching for God. What an awesome God we serve. But listen to what happens each time a judge passed away in verse 19 there of chapter 2. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted, reverted back to their old sin. And not just that they reverted back to the old sin and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their own stubborn ways. Question again, I asked you, I uh, kind of mentioned it last week, I asked you again, if you see a cycle of sin, where's the true repentance? If they cry out to God or God delivers them, where's the true repentance of turning from who they were and what they were doing and turning to God? All the people were doing here in the book of Judges, catch this. As a nation, this is what they're doing. Oops, we got busted. Thanks God for the help. Next time we're in trouble, we'll call you. We never see that today, do we? And what happened was their rebellion and their cycle of sin just keeps getting worse and worse. And wait until the final week of this series when we get to Judges 17 through 21. You got a story of a priest being hired by somebody else. And he takes a concubine. And this concubine, they throw her out the door so that they don't get beat up and killed. She gets raped. They cut her into 12 pieces and send her to the leaders of the 12 tribes. It's crazy. But wait till we get to the end of Judges and you see how bad. It gets. But what we're going to do tonight is we're actually going to look at chapter 3. <clears throat> and in chapter 3, in verses 7 through 11, we're introduced to the first of the judges. Othniel. And the Lord delivered the people through Othniel, and the land had rest, and Israel had peace for 40 years. And then in verse 31 here in chapter, thir uh, chapter 3, we get to our third judge, and his name is Shemgar. And we don't get much in verse 31 about who Shamgar is, but there is some information to know about him. I'm not going to spend time on it tonight because I want to focus in on Ehud. But if you want to know more about Shamgar, I will share some stuff with you from Tony Evans. And um, the reason I say that is because Shamgar is Tony Evans. If you know who Tony Evans is, he's out in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Pastor, great pastor. I love listening to him. He dives into detail about Shamgar because he, his favorite judge is Shamgar. But our focus this evening is going to be on Ehud. And he was the second judge, and he's in verses 12 through 30. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the story and kind of narrate to it to you real quick, read a couple of the scriptures. And then I'm, at the end, I'm going to bring out a couple key points because there's so much here. After Othniel died, the first judge, the people reverted back to their cycle of sin, their old ways. And listen to what verses 12 through 14 says here, talking about coming up to Ehud as a judge. Verse 12, the, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. There's the start of the cycle. Then he gathered himself to himself, the people of Ammon and Amalek, and went and defeated Israel, took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. Listen, this Eglon, he was a bad, 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 bad man. For 18 years, him and the Moabites and his army, they pillaged, they raped, and they murdered the Israelites. And verse 15 says this, But when the children of Israel cried out, here's one of the times they cried out to the Lord, 
When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord had raised up and delivered for them Ehud, the son of Gareth, the Benjamite. Well, listen to this. This is so key right here of what I'm going to talk about all night tonight. A left-handed man. Literally, Ehud, he was a man that couldn't use his right hand, which means he was probably one, either deformed from birth, or two, he was disabled in some way sometime throughout his life. Listen, today if you would find left-handed people, anybody in here left-handed? I know there are a couple of eyeballs in here. No, I'm joking. I love you too. But anyway, seriously, when you think about left-handed people, left-handed, the world is set up for who? Right-handed people. Yes, it's gotten better, but it is an inconvenience today to be a left-handed person. In those days, being left-handed, it wasn't just an inconvenience. It was regarded as a severe impairment, especially in strength and authority. But Ehud, he was chosen, or he was volunteered. We don't know. The text doesn't clearly say. But the people took and, and Ehud, they sent Ehud with a tribute, a tax payment to Eglon, king of Moab, at the end of verse 15. So Ehud, what he does, this severely impaired person, deformed or from some accident, we don't know. He's looked down upon, no power, no strength, no authority. They send him. Only thing I can imagine, hey, what's in this left-handed guy? If we get rid of him, it's no big loss. That's kind of the thinking. So he was chosen, he was volunteered, he, he, he loaded it up. But he also does one other thing. He packs up one other thing. He packs up this 18, about an 18 inch double edged sword. And what he does is he takes the sword and he straps it under his clothes to his right thigh. Because he's left handed. And in verse six, and he does that in verse 16. And then listen to what verses 17 through 23 says when he gets to Eglon and takes the tribute to him, the king of Moab. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon is a very fat man. And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute, but he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, Hokim, I have a secret message for you. He said, keep silence. And all who attended him went out. So all the servants of Eglon, he sent them out. Then Ehud said to the king, I have a message from God for you. It's a left-handed man. There's no guards in the room. Eglon feels no threat from this left-handed, powerless Ehud. So he arose from his seat, King Eglon. And then Ehud, he reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw out the dagger out of his belly. And his entrails came out. Then Ehud went out through the porch, shut the doors of the upper room behind him, and locked them. Listen, Ehud was left-handed. He couldn't use his right hand. Eglon, the king of Moab, would not have seen a left-handed man as a threat. Literally, Eglon did not see this coming, which is why he let himself be in the room alone with Ehud. He never thought about a left-handed man pulling out a sword from his right thigh. Even the hand handle sank into Eglon and his, listen, I, I'm just telling you what scripture says. His entrails come out. The NIV, NIV says his bowels discharge. And the most direct of them all, the ESV says the dung came out. I'm just doing what scripture says. But again, like I said last week, isn't this one of the stories you want to tell your kids or grandkids at that time? No, I don't think so. Then, in verse 24 through 26, Eglon's servants, they come to the door and they found that the door was closed and locked and they're thinking, it smells bad in here. Maybe he's in the inner room relieving himself. The servants waited, but after a little bit of time when Eglon never came and opened the door, they got a key, they went in, and they found their king dead on the floor. 
And by this time, Ehud had escaped and, and goes in verses 26 through 29. He goes to rally the troops. And Ehud tells the people to follow him because the Lord had given Moab into their hands. And verse 30 says this. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel. And the land had rest for 80 years. So what are we supposed to learn from this? What are we supposed to do with this? Believe it or not, listen to me. Believe it or not, all the keys to spiritual victory are in this color, colorful and disturbing story. Number one, you notice the left-handed man? God works through our weaknesses. Ehud, he's a, he's a very picture of an unlikely Savior. He lacks the one thing that any deliverer needs, a strong right hand of power. Are you getting where I'm going with this? Ehud is pointing us forward 1,000 years to the most left-handed Savior that would ever live on this earth, Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus, he was born poor in a manger. Physically, Jesus was not intimidated. Isaiah the prophet says there would be nothing, that there's nothing about Jesus that would be appealing or would attract us to him. He was a man that was despised and rejected. Paul says in Philippians that he took the form, listen, of a bond servant. It's the lowest of servants. And he died as an outcast on a cross, yet from this despised outcast, God is going to bring Satan's armies. To their knees. And like Eglon, the devil never saw Jesus coming in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the most unlikely. He didn't look like the Savior that they were expecting. See, this story of Ehud, he reminds us. It reminds us that most of us, most people think that we are going to accomplish great things through our strengths and our talents. I have to be good enough. I have to be smart enough, rich enough, powerful enough. Because only then can I succeed. Isn't that what the world tells us today? But Ehud shows us that power and success is not found within ourselves. It's only found in Jesus Christ. And listen, we even sing about this in children's song. Tell me if you can make this song right here. They are weak, but... He is strong. What song is that? Yes, Jesus loved me. See, we sing about it. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1 that this is why most people miss the gospel. This is what he says, that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put the shame of the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put the shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of this world and the things which are despised, God has chosen and things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that it is written, he who glories boasts, who, he who glories or boasts, let him glory or boast in the Lord alone. Where do we get the power to live the Christian life, walk like he has asked us to do, and do the work that we can't do in his own strength? By leaning into the strength of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. There's one advice I can give any Christian in this world. This is what it would be. The best thing that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, could ever, ever do is to own up to our weaknesses. And bring them before Jesus Christ. The thing that keeps people from seeing God work in and through them is not our weaknesses. It's our strengths. Our strengths are our greatest liabilities. And our weak weaknesses are our greatest assets. Have you ever thought of it that way? Listen to it again. Our strengths, when we're proud and we think we can do it on our own, it is our greatest liability. But our weaknesses... 
are what our greatest strengths are when we take up the Jesus Christ. Amen? See, what God does is He only fills empty hands. He fills empty vessels. And when we think or pretend like we have it all together, you have filled yourself with your own talents and your own ability. And God is unable to fill you with His strength to do what only He can in and through you. Isn't that the truth of salvation? Only when we fall before Him in our total weakness because we're completely helpless to do anything about our condition, then and only then can He fill us with His presence and transform us into who He wants us to be for His glory. Hear this closely. This is awesome. If dependence on God is the objective, aren't we supposed to be fully dependent on God and God alone? If dependence on God is the objective, then recognizing our weaknesses and taking them to Jesus Christ is our greatest asset. Paul even says that in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, my, the Lord says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, most gladly, listen to this. Most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, the most absurd statement this world can ever hear. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. In reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong, because it's Christ that lives in me. Amen? In our weakness, Jesus Christ proves himself to be strong. Question. I need to say this one on a Sunday morning. Why are our altars not full. At churches everywhere in front of this church, I stand in front of people that are weak and powerless to do what God has called us to do and still are empty, our altars remain empty. Why they say empty is because I think, because we think and we pretend like we have it all together and that's what's holding the church back today. Number one, God works through our weaknesses, which leads us to the second thing this evening. In God's kingdom, I think I've said this the past couple weeks in some way, God keeps bringing me back to this point. In God's kingdom, in God's economy, availability is more important than ability. Why? Because God provides everything we need, the strength, wisdom, people, resources, everything we need. All we have to do is make ourselves available for him to fill us. Henry Blackaby, does anybody know who Henry Blackaby is? A couple of you do. Some of you have been through the series with me. He's the co-author of the series called Experiencing God, and I plan on going through that with a group or with, maybe even with this whole church at some point. He's co-author of Experiencing God, and, and he says that God can do more in and through 10 people on fire for God than a church of 1,000 people that are half-hearted, that make excuses and are unavailable for the mission of Christ. Listen to me. Let me put it in perspective right here as I begin to close up. Think about the availability of the little boy in John chapter 6 where he comes, you ready for this? He comes with a Hebrew happy meal of five loaves and two small fishes. And Jesus he wanted to feed 5,000 men. The estimated number of people there that he fed was somewhere around 15 to 18,000, including women and children. The people sit down. And Jesus, he takes this Hebrew happy meal and he feeds all of them with 12 baskets left over. He ended up with more than he ever started with. Listen to me. Jesus was demonstrating to his disciples. Jesus was demonstrating to us this simple fact. Listen, this is powerful. Jesus can do more 
with one act of obedience than a lifetime of our own human effort. Amen? Basically, when this little boy, the disciples say, yeah, we got this little boy over here. He's got this happy meal. He's got five, five loaves of bread and two fishes. You know what Jesus was asking the young boy? You ready? This is so powerful. Jesus was asking, can I have your lunch? Is your lunch available for me to eat? Hmm. Jesus today is asking us the same question. Can I have your lunch? Are you available for my use? Ehud, the most, one of the most left-handed saviors you could ever imagine, God took and delivered the nation of Israel for 80 years. You may not feel like you are much, or what you have to offer is that great. And let me tell you something, if you don't feel like much, you don't have much to offer, you'd be right. You have nothing to offer the king of the world, except for yourself. But he has so much to offer to you, and he has so much to offer this world in and through you so that his glory can shine. When I listen to the story of Ehud, he didn't make excuses that he was disabled or deformed. He didn't make excuses that the people didn't look at him with authority and power. All that Ehud did, did he said, yes, Lord, I'm available. He yielded himself to the King of kings and Lord of lords. And the Lord did a mighty and powerful work in and through him. And that's the point I get from the story of Eva. Let's yield ourselves. Let's yield our weaknesses to his mighty hand. And let's sit back and watch and do the work he tells us to do. And do what we should see. The wonder and the work that only God can do. Because when we yield ourselves to Him, when we yield our weaknesses to Him, we're going to see God, not us, we're going to see God do great and mighty works. Are you weak tonight? Good. Are you available? Is the question. That's even better. Because God will do extraordinary things through ordinary people who recognize, one, that they're weak, that lean, number two, lean into His strength, and three, and most importantly, people that make themselves available to his purposes to shine his glory. That's why I like the story of Eva so much. It reminds me, I need to be a little humbler before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Father, we thank you. We love you. <clears throat> and you just amaze us in every single way. From the brokenness that you brought us from. From the pain and the trials that you brought us through. And each and every time we get to see you and your glory and your greatness. And Father, tonight I pray for each one of us. I pray that we empty ourselves and make ourselves available to you. And Father, we will follow you. We will follow where you want us to go and what, is, what you want us to do for your name and your glory. God, Father, all we do is we ask that you go before us and prepare the way. Provide for us each and every step of the way. And Father, send your presence with us as we go out and share your name and your glory. Go before us and prepare the hearts and minds of those out there that you're wanting us to reach. Be with us and guide us, strengthen us, and give us the wisdom and the words that we need. And most of all, Father, Remind us each and every day it's about you and your Lord. We love it and we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Next week, chapters 4 and 5. Uh, maybe if I get there. No, I don't even have it up there. Sorry. But it's on the bottom of your notes. Chapter 4 and 5. Love y'all. Have a great week. Facebook, join us back Sunday morning or come visit this person. We'll be glad to have you. Have a great rest of the week.